welcome to a very special episode of Ready, Stem, Go. I'm Mackenzie Oliver and for this episode I'm passing over my hosting duties to the Vice-Chancellor of QUT, Professor Margaret Scheel. She'll be having a chat with Minister Karen Andrews, a very special mechanical engineering alumni from QUT. It's wonderful to have the Minister here today and, and we're very proud of your achievements as a QUT is one of our outstanding alumni and I think between you and another Karen, our first two engineering graduates from QUT. So, and it's timely, I think, also just to mention that um, she couldn't be with us today because she had her first meeting with her new boss and her fellow deans, but we've just appointed a female dean of engineering, which is a first for QUT, Professor Anna Delatic from UNSW, who's a water engineer. So we're going to look forward to uh, introducing her and some of her heads of school colleagues are here today. Um, I, another first which I may mention is that Kerry's appointment as a Pro Vice-Chancellor of Sustainability is the first in the sector. Um, and I say that the first because I'm sure that others will follow with similar appointments and we're really looking forward to the way that role will be able to integrate the strategy across education and research and or our activities in sustainability. So that's enough about us. Um, uh, um, you'll be lucky to know that we've got some very distinguished um, journalist uh, alumni as well, but I'm not going to be nearly as penetrating as Lee Sales or uh, Ellen, Ellen Fanning. Well, that's um, good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought we'd just ask, how do you think your engineering um, background set you up for your career in politics? Well, I often say that I use my engineering skills every single day. To me, everything is a project. It has a start, it has an end, it has a process in between it. And it's not to say that I'm inflexible, I can be quite flexible along the way, but everything for me has a start, a finish, and a way to get to the, the end point. So there's, um, there's that part of, I guess, my engineering skills, because in, in, in many ways, that is what engineering is about. But Perhaps even more importantly, it's um, the problem solving skills that I have to use every single day as well. I've um, always believed that I was personally very outcomes focused and I always wanted to find a, a solution and I believe everything has a solution, it's just a case of finding it. But those skills, I believe, were, were honed during my time at, uh, at QUT and then subsequently working as an engineer. So I use those skills every day. And, you know, I often get asked this, um, and I'm sure you do as well, um, we, we both worked very hard in various ways um, towards achieving so, um, equity or, or, or greater representation of women in science or STEM areas. Why do you think that's important for the country, not as well as those individuals who succeed in that way? Because uh, we need to have the best possible talent that there is and women are roughly 50% of the population here and if we aren't drawing on the skills from our females um, in our population then we are running the risk of not getting the best possible outcomes. So I think it's really we have a talent pool, let it make it, let's make the largest possible talent pool and that means that women, particularly in the STEM areas, must be uh, included and we must increase those numbers. I was... Um I've just I'm giving a presentation on Friday for International Women's Day, and um, I've been reading a book on it. It's called Invisible Women, and they, one of the stories in there was that when they got more women into the transport planning in Sweden, they got better outcomes for the population as a whole because they turned the transport planning in simple things like um, snow ploughing uh, towards uh, where there was the greatest um, need, which was actually pedestrians who had the greatest accident rate. So that was just one, a small example that I, I read recently. Mm. But um, there's also, um, I think, um, uh, as I've been reading um, this, this book, it talks a, little, a lot about the need to have heroes and so that mm. they're people, um, uh, girls, and, and uh, as we may not have seen too many, um, can uh, some people that they can aspire to be like and who be inspired by. So it, do you have any examples of those you found inspiring? And Well, you, you may well be, when I start, surprised at, um, at, at my answer, but my inspiration was actually my sister. Um, so Anne is her name, and Anne's two years older than, than me. Anne's um, pretty well qualified. She, um, she 
has a Bachelor of Ag, she's got a Master's in Agriculture, she's got a um, Bachelor in, in Psych um, now and she's continuing to study. But uh, the school that Anne and I went to, it was Townsville uh, Grammar, and at the time that we were there, it was a boys' boarding school and a day school for girls and boys, so girls were absolutely in the minority. So Anne uh, finished school two years before me, went on to... Um, went on to ag, which is really still quite a male-dominated uh, field as well. And I guess I, um, I always looked up to her um, as a sister, but in terms of what she was achieving as well, because she got into an area that um, was not always easy to get into. It was agriculture's um, not an easy uh, field to work in. And so I looked up to, to her uh, because she was sort of the closest that, that I had that I could relate to because at the time that I went through school and on to university, there actually weren't that many leading women that you could uh, you could look up to. Obviously, they uh, existed and, you know, there were some um, heroes. Marie Curie was, was one of the women that I, I particularly admired and read a lot uh, about her, but I never knew her. Um, whereas I did know my sister. So I related to someone who I saw very regularly and who I thought was pretty awesome in terms of what she was achieving. And so did you come direct from Townsville to QUT or did...? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that would have been a big adventure to... Um, yes. Uh, uh, to, to, ..to leave and come to Brisbane and... and yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. So, um, so my sister obviously left uh, left first and came down to uh, Brisbane, uh, and then actually my father got transferred to the Gold Coast. So I sort of finished and came uh, down here and came to to QUT, and, and yes, it was an entirely different uh, experience. Uh, look, it's a big transition coming from school to a university anyway, and um, I have a daughter who's just finished um, year 12, and she's going through the process of transitioning into university, so it's a huge step. But of course, when you're relocating as well, it just puts that added dimension to it to make it just that little bit more interesting. Because one, one of the things that I'm passionate about is that I've found, I think, one of the things that stops girls going into maths, uh, into STEM careers is the lack of maths Ability, not ability, but opportunity. And I went to an all-girls school where I wasn't allowed to do the higher level of maths. I think actually because they couldn't teach it. So, uh, no, I'm serious. Oh. I mean, no, because that, that, these nuns would have done anything for us. So if they could have ta taught us after hours, I'm sure they would have, but they couldn't. And so the only way I could have done the higher level of maths is to go up to the boys' school up the road. So going to a, a school that was predominantly boys, did you have a... Did you and your sister have access then to a you think, uh, sort of a greater level of maths and science teaching than you might have in an all-girls school or, or do you um, have a comparison? Well, I actually have never thought about that in those um, terms uh, before, but certainly the subjects that were offered uh, to us, there was, there was never an issue for either of us. Uh, in our choice of subjects, we were, we were never encouraged to do one particular subject or another. It was just, so I did the advanced maths and it was, you know, I just filled it out in the form and away I went. So there was there was just never um, an issue. So maybe because it was a predominantly boys' school, uh, they biased towards those and to the manual arts, so you would work metal work um, as well. I actually didn't do those, but um, there was a probably a bit of a bias towards that, which was interesting because when my eldest daughter went, she went to a, um, an all-girls school and I was stunned when they were doing uh, the subject selections. I can't remember if it was for year nine. I think it was probably um, year nine. And I, I, I went and saw the head of the school and I said, well, where's your IT subjects? You know, I'm not seeing any of those things um, here. And they said, well, we don't have enough take-up. So they, don't, they didn't run um, IT. So... You know, it probably did, in in hindsight, have have an influence in terms of the subjects that were offered, and the fact that there was never a, there was never a question that I could do those subjects. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, it's it's I think it is a barrier because I, I know um, when we um, well certainly when I got to university I was going to major in maths and chemistry, but I ended up dropping maths because. When I got into second year, the fact that I hadn't done the higher level maths at school, I kind of got could only get so far. So mm. um, I think that's why I'm personally quite passionate about that particular question. Yeah. But um, when um, when we looked at women in the social sciences, uh, when I was at the ARC, um, there was a bias towards the non-quantitative 
social sciences for, for female applicants as well. So, you know, I think mm. there's an underpinning issue mm. there. But it's interesting. I hadn't heard the school story before, so that, that, that's quite relevant. Yeah. Um, well, now I know you haven't seen the questions. I can, I can ask away. I can just uh, pick a number. Can, what's question yeah. five? <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, it's kind of related because I said, um, is, is it enough just to get girls interested in STEM? How else can we get more um, um, excited about STEM? But how else can we get more, more girls interested? Do you know what? I really wish I knew the answer to that because this is pretty much a nut that I need to crack. So um, I actually appointed the Women in STEM Ambassador, Lisa Harvey-Smith, and one of the things that I've asked her to do is have a look at all of the programs that we have for women in STEM and come back to me with advice on which of the programs that are working because there's actually a lot of money that is spent uh, encouraging girls to undertake the STEM subjects at school and uh, to go into STEM uh, careers. But we've still got significant shortages in the number of girls and women that want to um, study STEM. So I've asked her to do that. So we'll work through that um, process. I think a lot of this, though, has to do with the level of excitement that can be generated. And to have students understand that um, it's one thing, and this is probably an example um, that, that relates to your, um, your history. Um, it's, it's one thing to do the subjects at school that are going to give you the best ATAR at the end of it. But what you might need to do is look at what the future is likely to hold for you because you found the difficulties and you're clearly bright. So going into university and just the catch up that you have to do in the higher level of maths. And uh, I've almost lost count of the number of students who've spoken to me and they're not doing the higher level maths at school, but they want to be an engineer. And it must be extraordinarily difficult because engineering is three if not four years of, of maths. So to not have that higher level of maths just makes the workload so extraordinary. So I'm giving career advice now, I'm sorry, uh, Margaret, yeah, but you know, it, it is, it, it's, it's terribly um, difficult. So we've got to get young people excited at school. What we know is that if, um, if girls lose interest in maths and science between grade five and grade eight, we almost never get them back. So that is a really critical time. Now, I don't know what it is. Do, do girls at that point start to get concerned about asking questions? And you need to ask questions with um, maths and, and science because it is really problem solving. Is it that they're losing confidence? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'll be interested during um, Q&A also to, to hear uh, from you as to why you think girls walk away from maths and science in, in years five and eight because that's our problem area. Yeah, I'm not surprised that the data shows that because I think that, you know, because um, you also see a shift in all data that shifts from the maths and science side. So the issue of numbers in STEM more broadly is that there's more girls and women in, in biological sciences and biomedical science and the closer you get to, to maths, either through engineering or physical sciences, the numbers start to drop off and, and, and they do it in, in high school. So... So that's my um, my diagnosis is don't drop maths girls, okay? No, <laughs> or but don't there's, drop yeah, down. there's so many fun things. When when I go out to, uh, I'm going to wander off on a tangent yeah, now. That's I'm very funny. sorry. Uh, when I go out to, to schools and I, I speak to the the students, uh, because of I guess a bit of my background, but the job that I have um, now, I get to talk about three things that. Um, the students almost always listen very attentively to. I get to talk about dinosaurs, I get to talk about space, and I get to talk about Antarctica. And in terms of, um, I actually did a day trip to Antarctica. It was, uh, it was just fascinating. We may come back to that. But I think one of the things that, um, that we have to do is excite people about um, science and about maths and what you can see, what you can learn, what you can do. And I think that's probably missing a lot. And for girls in particular, that can open up a whole new dimension um, for them. So in terms of problem solving, we've got to look at, at, at how, we, um, how we deal with the, the big gap that we have at, in the grade five to year eight. But then as it's getting closer to making choices about career, to talk about what the future jobs are going to be um, and to demonstrate the opportunities that come through following a, a, a STEM pathway. So 
So tell us about Antarctica. Kerry's also just joined the advisory committee for a new initiative in, in Antarctica. So um, um, we'd be interested to hear, I think. Oh, well, Antarctica is fabulous. So um, although I, I, I didn't quite think that on the day that I was there, it was a perfect um, day. Um, so there was not a lot of wind um, around. It was minus seven degrees. I was there in summer. So it was actually the 13th of February was the date that, um, that I was in Antarctica. And I was actually flying down there to spend some time at Casey Station, the research station um, there. But the weather is very changeable. So as we were getting closer, they kept on saying, well, so there's limited flights to Antarctica. So it was flying on a, 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 a Saturday and it turned around and then came back again on the Tuesday. So I was going to go in on the Saturday, come out on the the Tuesday. So they said, you might not be able to go at all, um, or you might be there for at least a week. We don't know when we'll be able to get you uh, back. As it got closer, the only option was to go there and back on the day. So I had about four hours on the, um, on the ice. So you land on an ice runway, which does have a very soft blue um, to it. As you drill into an ice court, the ice is actually about the deepest blue you've got on that in colour as you look down. It's like ink um, as you're going through the ice. When we landed, the airport is nothing special. It's actually two shipping containers um, on top of each other. So it has an upstairs and a downstairs, which is quite nice. Um, and then we were put on I don't know, some sort of a snow um, mobile. And I actually sat in the equivalent of the trailer in the back and was talking to the, the scientists about the work that they were, were doing. When we got out of the, um, of the, the buggy, um, there were no signs of anything. All you could see was white, so it was overcast. So if you go skiing, you will at some times see a different colour. There was no different colour. Everything was white. And I couldn't even see where we had come from. And so I said, well, look, where's, where's, where's the terminal? And they said, oh, it's over there. And I couldn't see anything. And when I looked very closely, all I could see was it looked like a line like that because there was a snow hill in front of me. The terminal was behind it. And I just couldn't see anything. And it was a perfect example to me of what it must be like in terrible weather down there where you have no idea where you are. There are no landmarks. It's like being inside a ping pong ball. Um, when it's overcast. So it was just, it was an amazing um, experience to be able to be there. But you sort of think, you know, I've never been in such a harsh environment. Um, and when I was, uh, was there, it was, um, it was uh, shortly after there'd, there'd actually been a couple of fatalities um, down there, which was very difficult for everyone there. Uh, when, you're, when you're there, you have to be absolutely self-sufficient. There's no Bunnings down the road. Um, there's very limited opportunities to grow your own food, plenty of fish around, but um, it's, it's, it's an environment that is extremely harsh. But um, our scientists that are down there are doing amazing work because they're not only doing their research, they're actually repairing, maintaining all of the equipment they're making do. It is actually innovation at its best. That's uh, something I've got on my bucket list, but I don't know that I'll ever get there. <laughs> um, what do you think have been, um, some, say, some of your challenges in your career as an engineer? And um, do you think um, uh, that the, those of sitting with us today uh, will have the same challenges or do you think there'll be new ones? Um, well, I think when I graduated as an engineer, and maybe it was my um, approach or maybe it was, um, was the times, I don't, um, I don't know, I thought I was always treated very fairly. Uh, you could either do the job or you could not do the job. And if you could do the job, that was fine. You were accepted. If you weren't up to the job, quite frankly, it didn't matter if you were a male or um, a female in the engineering world in which, in which I worked. So um, I would hope that that is the, is the same. Now, um, the issue then becomes that what are the promotional opportunities and is that um, disproportionate amongst um, men and women? And I would have to say that I would think we have some very qualif well qualified women um, with, with great skills out working as engineers. Um, I would like them to see more opportunity for career progression and uh, for there to be opportunities for them to deal along with men with issues such as family responsibilities. Um, 
flexibility in, in working arrangements and to en enable women to actually progress where they, where they should. And in terms of forming leaders, um, how, I mean, there are studies that show um, something like 50% of the... Um, 50 of the top 200 CEOs have got a science or an engineering background. Um, do you think there's particular characteristics in, in the science and engineering space that develop uh, help when you're uh, moving on that leadership journey? I, I think it's definitely the problem-solving skills that, um, that you develop because often leadership is about finding a good solution to a problem and a way forward. So um, the fact that in science, um, in the STEM fields, you actually are honing those skills, I think it really does set you up uh, well for leadership of an organisation. And, um, and, and most engineers and scientists are very good at doing multiple things in parallel and working through those processes, that is also part of leadership as, as well. And I think picking up on your Antarctica example, one of the things that I found um, that was really um, important about being a scientist and it's one of the things I miss is that it's a very international profession um, and so you, I'm sure that the group in, in Casey had um, not only Australian scientists but scientists from around the world and certainly that's an, uh, an opportunity that, um, that some other areas just don't, don't bring, that, that are the mm. kind of international, global, not at the moment when we can't go anywhere, but we will be able to one day again, yeah. uh, a, a global dimension to, to, to what you do, which is really helpful. Absolutely. There was um, a lot of collaboration amongst the scientists from around the, uh, around the world. You know, various levels of accommodation that were there. Some of the accommodation for some countries was particularly uh, basic. Um, the Australians had a very large presence there and pretty good um, accommodation standards as well, but the level of scientific collaboration was really very good. And that's all for this very special episode of Ready STEM Go. Thank you again to QUT Vice-Chancellor Professor Margaret Scheel and to Minister Karen Andrews. Um, and for our listeners, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our Facebook group, QUT STEM is for me, to keep up to date with events and resources that you can access. <laughs>